good morning. Oh, good morning. Welcome to First Church Congregational Boxford Sunday morning service. We are delighted to have you here with us, and we are delighted to be here in the house of the Lord worshiping him this day. I've got some extra insight, excitement from some of our youth this morning, and they won't spoil that for anyone, but we will find out a little bit more about their excitement this morning later in the service. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out his speech, and night to night reveals his knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this morning, the privilege it is to gather. We ask that you would be with each of us, Lord, that we would come to know and feel and experience your presence this morning, Lord, that we would come to know you better, to deepen our relationship with you, or that you would hear our worship and praise, or that you would receive it. For we love you. We want to receive your love. So we thank you, Lord, again for this day. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, first introduce uh, the newest member of our worship team, uh, Beatrice Lyons, uh, who's joined us for the first time. Uh, she attended Gordon-Conwell and currently also works there as the manager of the donor programs. Um, and she also helps with the youth group uh, here as well. So big thanks uh, to her for joining us today. And, uh, with that, please join us as we open up with our first hymn. Please stand. Thank you. 
Amen. Now, <clears throat> there's a quick change, two quick changes I have to make to the bulletin for this week. The first, is it says that Jerry White is doing the children's message. Now, I will be doing the children's message. And the other change we're making is it's not so much a children's message as it is Pastor Tom's update on the Chicago Bears. If Andrew gets to talk about Alabama every Sunday, I can talk about my Chicago Bears one time. <laughs> this is still the children's message. Now, I love Chicago Bears probably too much. And there's something about that that I've always found really interesting. Anytime we're fans of any sports team, uh, we end up caring a lot about a bunch of people who we've never met and don't know that we exist. Khalil Mack is a defensive end for the Chicago Bears. He's a beast of a person. I care about him deeply. <laughs> he doesn't know I exist. Justin Fields is a rookie. He was Ohio State's quarterback last year. We drafted him 11th overall this year. He's a wonderful young man, I believe. I've never met him. He's real good at football, though. He's very special to me. Here's the problem. I believe in these, all these guys so much. They're going to lose today. They're going to lose. They're playing the, uh, the Rams, and they're going to lose. <laughs> no matter how much I believe in the Chicago Bears, they will lose today. They will go five and whatever this season. It will not be great. Our head coach will probably get fired. You can check back in with me at the end of the season on that prediction. No matter how much I care, the Chicago Bears are going to be bad this season. And there's, some, there's a futility in that. But I can't stop believing. <laughs> I can't stop caring. I want them to be good. And what struck me, and as many of you know, who are, care about sports, care about anything, whatever you, we decide to put our faith into, our belief doesn't always equal success. Does not always equal the results we want, except in one circumstance. When we have faith in God, we don't have to worry about whether or not he's winning on Sunday. Because the victory is already won. He's already won. And so whether it's your school sports team, whether it is a professional sports team, and I know this is a little bit new for New England to have, a, to have had a losing season last year for the Patriots. You guys look good this year, though. It'll be good. Regardless of what we put our faith into, if it's something of the world, if it's something on this earth, it will let us down. When we put our faith in the Lord, we know that our victory is assured. And what we get out of that is not the, the Lord's purposes will always be done. What we get is the peace of knowing that the Lord is for us. The comfort in knowing that Jesus is with us and he is working in our behalf. And so as this NFL season starts, as any sports season starts, as you were back at school playing sports, doing all kinds of things, think of that. Where are we putting our faith? Where are we investing our belief? Is it in our friends? Is it in our teams? Are we investing our faith in the Lord? Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that we can put our faith in you, Lord. Lord, that your victory is assured, that you have already won, Lord, and as we are victors in you. And I ask, Lord, that you would encourage each of us, that we would see your glory, Lord, 
that we would not put our faith in the things of this world, that we would not look to things of this world for joy, for peace. Lord, but that we would come to know you. And also, Lord, I take this time now to pray for our offering. As we enter into this time of offering, Father, that you would show us where we are holding back from you, Lord, where we have put up the walls in our heart and our mind around our soul, Lord, that we are holding back from you, things we have not surrendered. That this time is not simply about offering finances, Lord, but it is offering ourselves. Lord, that we would consider, where in our life, Lord, are we not following you? Are we not drawing closer to you? Reveal that to us, Lord, in this time, we pray. Amen.
We do praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you so much for the gifts that you've given us. Lord, that we would feel that conviction, that urgency, and our desire and joy to tell the world of the treasure that we have found. That treasure being your love. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We will now have a missions moment from our own Trudy Williams. It's on. You're good. Thank you. Oh. I, t I said it was on, and it turns out that was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's not good. Good morning. I'd like to start by reading a verse um, from Psalms. And it's just so fitting after listening to Beatrice and Abby sing. Um, in fact, when I was thinking about this morning and, and looking for a few verses to add into what I wanted to say, I kept coming across verses that said, sing to the Lord. Um, I wasn't really sure why, but. I think I know now. It was lovely, ladies. Psalm 96, 1 through 3. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. So I'd like to give you an update on what's happening from missions and outreach. Um, I think I'd, just one thing before I start, I think sometimes we think missions and outreach is a singular thing, but I just want to clarify really Oh, good. I don't have to use the teacher voice. Mark doesn't like that one. <laughs> We're just a hub. And so different members of Missions and Outreach have a varied passion in so many different areas. And what it is is I get the privilege of seeing those people serve with all their heart um, in all these different ways. And I appreciate that so much. And I don't always get time to say thank you. And I want to do that right now is to say thank you to all members of the missions and outreach team and all the people who support us because there is a lot going on that sometimes people don't see that's so behind the scenes. So thank you to them. First up, next week is the Apple Festival. You, Boxford. Unlike years past, where our participation in the Apple Festival was more centered around raising money for our missions, our new vision is that it's a time to be visible hands and feet of Christ to our community. There are three main directions that, um, in feeling this call from God to serve wholeheartedly, we have focused our energy on. First of all, we want to be available for parking um, using the facilities God has given us. Um, in light of that, we could still use a few people who are willing to help direct cars and have a safe place for the vendors to park and then the people who will be attending following that. So starting at 8.30, we hope to organize parking attendance and get that going. If you can work for a period of time, anytime from 8.30 up until 2 in the afternoon, please reach out to Pastor Tom or myself um, to let us know. We'd appreciate your help. Five minutes. I got it, Tom. It's just the f it's just the font is really big. Don't be scared by the three pages. I just learned my lesson that up here, when I'm nervous, I can't read anything below font 20. <laughs> I think it happened after my birthday. Um, second, we are plan on having a time of coffee and donuts starting around 9 o'clock. The festival doesn't actually start until 10, but understanding that the vendors that are parking 
um, may be scooting by and we want to be an outreach to them. So at the coffee and donut table, we'll be handing out coffee and donuts, but also offering um, some reusable bags that people can use to shop the Apple Festival as the patrons begin to park, and also a pamphlet about First Church. Um, and at this time, um, surprisingly, we are all set, I believe, with the volunteers for serving coffee and donuts. That seemed to be the first one people were interested in helping with, and I'm not really sure why, but donuts, maybe. Um, last, as the morning progresses and the festival really begins, we hope to have a time of fellowship and fun that is more kid-friendly and centered. Um, the Merrills have graciously offered to bring their goats, and Jane Mulcahy is organizing a kid's booth where kids can fish for a free, fun little prize. And we'll also transition as we run out of donuts um, from handing out them to handing out water and slush cups. Um, if you would like to help with the kids' booth, please see Jane Mulcahy. I'm sure she would appreciate that help. Um, our letter writing campaign continues to grow. And so where we started with 17 writers in July, we had 25 letters go out from FCCB um, in August. We are so encouraged that people are still asking to participate. Um, the, I want to clarify that these letters don't just go to our prisons locally, although they do that, but they also go all the way across the country. So, and the prisoners need to request to get a care package. Um, last month, over 400 inmates requested to receive these packages, um, but I believe it was less than 200 that actually had a personal note in them. So. They're still getting the package, but that little note of personal encouragement that's handwritten, some of those inmates didn't get that. So if you have it in your heart, the letter paper is small. I showed it last time. If you could just do one or two, that's one or two more people that get that personal note of encouragement. Um, there are five or six different pieces in each mailing, but not everyone gets that. Um, the postcards, they get a verse, um, a testimony, a lesson material, a track. And the people, Carolyn and Doug, who run New Brothers Prison Fellowship, um, because this is a growing ministry, we're also considering hosting the packing day that happens at the end of the month. So please stay tuned for that, um, because that might be a time of fellowship and service that we can do together as a church. Fostering Hope, um, our ministry to foster care and adoption, is having a Siblings Ties event on Saturday, October 23rd, and that's at First Church of Christ, and I'm not sure if that's Haverhill, um, from 1 to 4. I can get that place on that. Um, this is an event planned to give foster children a chance to be with biological brothers and sisters, as families are often split up when children go into foster care. And we need volunteers from First Church to help with crafts, activities, and food. Um, if you um, would like to assist with that, you can reach out to me or Leslie Van Volkenberg, um, and there'll be more information on that to come. The Pregnancy Care Center is hosting a Vision for Life fundraising banquet on October 21st, which is a Thursday night. And I know that seems, in light of all that's going on, a ways away, but the um, Notice just came, and the RSVP is by September 23rd. Um, so I just, this is the card that I received, and also if you can't attend the banquet but would like to make a donation, there'll be cards available, so I hope to have those available for you next week. Um, Red and Roses, I believe, is getting underway, and Norma Rushton spearheads that event um, for packing lunches. Um, that are taken, I believe, to Lowell. So if you um, have um, time in the day to, I'm not sure what day of the week that is, you can reach out to Norma about their uh, role in that for Bread and Roses. Tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow, very good. Is there a time? By noon? Thank you. Lawrence, thank you. Thank you for clear. I knew the L, the Lawrence and Lowell, I do sometimes confuse. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so 12.30 tomorrow. And last, 
five minutes, 30 seconds. Um, please don't forget to pray for our missionaries abroad. Um, I think sometimes we are caught up in all the wonderful things we're trying to do to serve locally. Um, but with COVID and the hostile environment to Christians, I think they face challenges that make some of the challenges we face daily pale in comparison. So I encourage you, if you don't already have one of the bookmarks that we put out for the National Day of Prayer, if you can keep that in the front of your Bible and if you have an extra minute any time in the day, lift up one of our missionaries um, in prayer. Um, I think that would just be a heartwarming way to serve in a small way that makes a huge difference when we reach out to the Lord to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. We're now going to hear from Jane Okehi on our Women's Connection. Good morning. Um, two years ago when my family came here, we were I was invited to the Women's Study, which was a journey through the Bible. It was the casket empty with Carol Kaminsky. And it, it changed me. It um, spoke to um, things I was experiencing in my life at that time. And um, I'm blessed to be able to invite you um, to participate in this study again this year, um, starting October 13th in the Coggin Room on Wednesday nights for women. Um, it's the old casket study, but this is the, the full, the full uh, package. It will be an 18-week study. We're only going to do it in um, six-week chunks, so six weeks in the fall, take a break, six weeks in the winter, take a break, six weeks in the spring. And when I tell you that, um, to have the Old Testament speak to me the way it did um, two years ago, uh, I jumped at the chance to be able to be a part of that again this year. So I would encourage any, any women that would like to join to um, be a part of that, invite friends um, to attend, uh, to have that experience of the Old Testament that can speak into your life today was truly life-changing for me. Um, so that's going to start October 13th, and the fall session will run through November 17th from 7 to 8.15 in the Coggin Room. And if you have kids in the youth group, it's perfect timing because your kids will be over here and you can be over there. So um, just encourage you to attend that with us. And Carol will be teaching, which is just a gift in and of itself. Um, also, for women, Christina Clark will be hosting a study on Galatians at her home in Wenham, and the address is in the bulletin, and Christina's here today. There she is over there. Um, and that's starting Thursday, September 30th from 10 to 1130 at her home. Um, so you can find more information about that in the bulletin, and you can talk to Christina. Also, a community Bible study will be happening Wednesday mornings, and that's open to women and offers child care. So if you have young children and you need child care, that's available. Uh, Liz Arthurs is teaching on First and Second Peter, Job, James, and Colossians. Also, uh, for that, information is available at northshore.cbsclass.org. Um, also, women's group meets for lunch on the first Monday of the month at the Rally Pancake House, and I know there's a women's prayer meeting as well. All of that information is the, in the bulletin, so you want to be looking for emails and um, praying about where you can join together in fellowship and community this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy and Jane, for those updates. I just have a couple quick announcements to add. Uh, first, uh, is the announcement we've got the memorial service coming up for Jean Melzar. It'll happen Wednesday, September 22nd at uh, 1130 in the sanctuary for all who would like to attend that. Um, second, I just want to uh, add on that we have a number of facility needs here in our community. And this is a general call to those who are able-minded, embodied, and spirited uh, to serve in these ways. Um, if you would like to help with any of the facility needs, this is everything from moving chairs to some bigger projects we have. You don't need to sign up for everything. But if you get me your information, we can include you on the list. And this is a kind of a make what you can scenario. Um, but if God has called you to serve in that way, to help with our facilities here, we'd greatly appreciate that. 
Um, finally, uh, in line with that, we also have our open house coming up on the 26th. Uh, we are looking for, we have two needs in line with that. Uh, we need help with setup and breakdown for that event, which will be the Saturday before, so the 25th. Uh, and additionally, we are looking uh, for any generous folks who would be willing to make some baked goods for desserts for that event as well, which is always exciting. I too will be making something. I just haven't decided yet. Some of you have had my cheesecake, and you can attest to how good it is. Um, wonderful. So if you have any questions about anything you heard this morning, please let myself know, Jane, Trudy, whoever else was mentioned. We'd love to point you in the right direction. Uh, this morning, as we enter our time of corporate prayer, we also do just want to remember uh, all those who lost their lives uh, on September 11th, many years ago now, but the, those, that grief, that mourning is still fresh for so many of us. Um, I know that when I, was, I grew up in Connecticut, right outside New York City, and uh, I had many friends who lost their parents that day, and that, that grief and that pain doesn't fade. Uh, as so many of you know. So we want to be in remembrance this morning for that. We also just want to be praying for ongoing for our mission partners, for the ministries of our church that we both support and are, play an active role in. Um, and if there are any other prayer requests this morning that folks have to lift to the Lord, uh, we would love to share them with you. Joanna. Wonderful. Well, happy birthday to your mom. Wonderful. And we'll be praying for your upcoming doctor appointment. Dr. March. Dr. March. Got it. Yeah. Wonderful. What else can we lift up to the Lord this morning? Liam. Oh, 30th birthday for Jan Mulcahy. Happy birthday, Jane. 30 is a big one. <laughs> Any other praises or prayer requests this morning? Kim, yeah. Absolutely. Be praying for Maya Bragdon's dear child who's struggling with the tumor. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, I'll be praying for all the students who are uh, returning to school and what again is a just a kind of back and forth environment not really always knowing what it's school is always a little challenging but again in this environment it's a extra challenge anything else yeah Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so as so many of us know, Andrew is in Virginia. Um, that Vienna Prez for uh, says, I think it's a send off service kind of thing. Is that right, Becky? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's something, and it's special. Uh, and so Andrew is there, so we'll be praying for the James family, but also for Andrew's safe travels as he returns to us soon. What else could we be praying for this morning? Mm. 
So you see your brother Chuck? Chuck. Chuck. So we're praying for swift healing for him. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, with that, let's take these prayer requests to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. Lord, again, we thank you for this morning. Lord, that we should be thankful for every morning that we have with you. Lord, and I ask that you would, uh, in your majesty, Lord, just be with each of us. In your mercy, we would experience your presence. And we fall so short of your glory. Lord, and there are many praises and prayers we have this morning. Lord, things that we've said, things that we've left unsaid. But we know that you, you know our hearts. Lord, and you know the things that concern us. And you desire to shoulder those burdens for us, Lord. So we would be able to focus solely on you. So we do praise you for the work that you're doing, Lord. We praise you for the work that you're doing with Meyer Bragdon, Lord. Pray that her radiation would um, not afflict her in such a, as, as hard as that can be, as radiation treatment can be, Lord, and that she would not suffer through it, Lord, but that she would feel your peace. Pray for the whole family that they would feel your comfort and peace. Similarly, we pray for Chuck, Lord, as he waits to be seen. We ask for healing for him and for all those who are in hospital now, struggling, Lord. You give them comfort and healing. We pray for the doctors, nurses who are serving. We pray for Johanna with his uh, doctor's appointment coming up. And similarly, Lord, we pray for healing. Lord, restore just a continued health. And Lord, and praise for her mom's birthday. Pray for Jane's birthday as well and all those of us who are celebrating uh, soon or today, just another year that we have known you. Another year that we have delighted in the gift of life that you have given us. And the gift of being in a relationship, Lord. We can celebrate that you desired for us to know each other in such intimate ways, Lord. We can celebrate with one another. It's the care and love that we have. We pray for Andrew, Pete. We pray for the James family. As they, uh, Pete and Chris make this transition. And uh, for Andrew as he travels home, but also gets some time uh, where he grew up, Lord, to be with you, to Sabbath with you. And Lord, we also finally pray for uh, all those who are students and teachers. Lord, this year and, and the difficulties that come with that in this season, we just ask for your grace to be in their lives, Lord, your endurance and strength, Lord, to be abundant. So we thank you, Lord, that we can come and submit these things to you, Lord, knowing that they are heard, that you receive our prayers, Lord. And that by our faith, we get to receive you. So we thank you again, Lord, for this time. We love you and praise you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, 
that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist in standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The word of the Lord. So as all of you have noticed by now, and because we just prayed for it, I'm by myself this Sunday. Which means that we can do things a little bit differently. And in fact, if you'll bear with me, I want to try something here real quick. Just be patient for a second. I just want to see how this goes. Um, we're trying something new. As you all just heard, I now have entrance music. <laughs> my shirt became untucked. You'll forgive me for my appearance. <laughs> that song is uh, written and performed by Johnny and Colin Mulcahy. Thank you so much, boys. Uh, we were only able to play a small portion of it, but I assure you, it is a full length and beautiful ballad. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> we won't institute entrance music for uh, the rest of the Sundays coming up. That was a one-time deal. <laughs> Sets a, a weird focus. <laughs> this is the last week of our series in First Peter. We began this series in July, and we gave out these bookmarks or leaflets with the sermon series on it and the dates and what passages we would be preaching on. It was all really convenient and I really like them actually and I hope we continue to do them in the, for future series. But there was another bit of information on there that I'd like to extrapolate on a bit. There's a subtitle that we've given this series. Restore, confirm, strengthen, establish. And that subtitle comes from the passage we're looking at today. But before we get into that, I want us to consider a few things. I want us to ask ourselves first, what do we expect from God? And why do we expect it? What do we expect from God and what do we expect him to do? What role do we expect him to play in our lives? And why do we expect those things? Where do those beliefs come from? Now, you may have an easy answer here. You may think, I expect nothing from God. I don't believe you. You certainly do expect things from God. And that's okay. We're supposed to. He wants us to. Now, you may think, I expect for the Lord to love me and show me his mercy. And that's a very good Sunday school answer. But I want to challenge us to go deeper, to get to the basement of our understanding of God, the foundation of our faith. Do we have the expectation that the Lord will protect us? Do we expect that the Lord will lead us to prosper? Do we expect that the Lord will make things easier or always provide a way forward? What are the things we expect of God? And again, where do those beliefs come from? Do we have a passage or a part of scripture that supports where these beliefs are coming from? Where do our expectations of the Lord come from? 
Now, I really want us to consider this question as we continue to look at the passage today because my fear is that for many of us, some of our expectations do not come from the Lord, but from what we think we deserve, what we think we're entitled to, that our expectations of God is not based on his word, but what we think Christianity should be. That as members of the body, we are focused a bit too much on the member benefits or what we think the benefits should be. Again, as we look at this passage, this is the end of Peter's letter, and he's going to double down on many of the truths that have already been revealed to us through the messages we've heard. But Peter is also challenging us to understand who we are in relation to God and what the responsibility is for all those who call on his name. Let's pray. So I can catch my breath. Father, we do just thank you so much for this morning again. I've already thanked you so many times for this morning, Lord, and I can't stop. Because it is a gift. And I ask, Lord, that you would reveal your truth to us, that you would speak your truth through me to your people, that your spirit would be present and impact our hearts, that we would come to reflect you more through the hearing of this word. So we thank you and praise you. Praise in your name. Amen. So as we look at the first verse of this passage, there's two words that I want to explore right off the bat. Those words are exhort and elder. You'll often hear from one of us up here that a certain passage is an exhortation or that the author is exhorting his audience. Uh, but we don't see the word itself that much in scripture. And we don't really go over what it means up here. I'm as, uh, very guilty of this. I will often, when I'm preaching, just say this passage is an exhortation. Or he's saying this to exhort. I don't ever say what that is. An exhortation in the context of Scripture is literally, it means to call someone to be present. But it isn't a word that we should interpret literally. It's an, it is an invitation to do a better job. To be better in the politest terms. It's a strong appeal, and it can be used as either an encouragement or a criticism, and is often both at the same time, as we see in this passage. The other word that we must come to a correct understanding of is elder. And the hardest part about this word is the wide application of it that it has for today, and the wide application that it had in the first century. We have elders in our church, as many churches do, but the modern iteration of eldership and first century eldership, while similar, are not exactly the same. And this shouldn't surprise us too much, since we aren't in the first century anymore. Church leadership has changed as the world has changed. But the foundation has stayed the same. In many places of scripture, including this one, elder doesn't refer to a position of authority or age, but a position of stewardship. This is something that we have retained, but is often lost in our understanding of eldership. The key here for this passage is understanding that eldership in this context and in our church is not an indication of rank. Rather, it is a position of responsibility and expectation. Elders were and are expected to be seeking the Lord's wisdom on behalf of the entire community. This first passage is addressed specifically to the elders of the church, but it sets an expectation for those being served by the eldership. So, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock that is among you, Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Again, this is an example that Peter is giving the church of true eldership and also sets an expectation. Peter is saying this, applying it to himself as well. And he gives five points for us to consider. 
One, shepherd the flock. Two, be an overseer. Three, serve willingly, not compulsory. Four, serve eagerly, not for shameful gain. And five, being an example, not domineering. As we look at these, shepherding, what is that? When looking at the passage, the passages that Jesus expands on this idea of shepherding, there are two main components, feeding and tending. It's the elder's responsibility to feed the congregation with scriptural truth and tend to the congregation with spiritual guidance. This overseeing, and this term comes from a Greek word, meaning manage or supervise. The elders are to supervise the affairs of the congregation having to do with discipleship and managing things like funding. Three, serve willingly, eagerly, and by example. That's actually the last three. These points have more to do with our relationship with God than the actions we take. Elders are to lead by example, a willingness to serve the Lord and eager to see his work done. Peter contrasts this with someone who serves in a domineering way, lording over the flock for shameful gain, or because of a self-importance or self-inflation. Now, there's far more than what I've just said that pertains to leadership and eldership in Scripture. There's tons on it in Scripture. It was not meant to be exhausted, exhaustive, but this is a wonderful summary that Peter has given us, and it serves two functions. Again, first, he's addressing the elders, exhorting them to live into and up to the call on their lives. And second, it is setting the expectation for the community. This is what can and should be expected of elders. Elders should be held to a standard. And the congregation should hold eldership to that standard. At the same time, we cannot add arbitrary things to this list. We cannot say, yes, shepherding, yes, oversight sounds good, but also... Elders should be the ones who tithe the most. Or a true elder would know the most about scripture. Or a real elder would be able to do X, Y, and Z, fill in the blank. We should hold our leadership to a standard. Absolutely. You should hold me to a standard. But we must hold leadership to a biblical standard. We do not get to decide what that standard is. The reason I stress this is because I think we have the tendency to push onto leadership what is our own responsibility. We expect from others what we should be expecting from ourselves. Peter continues in verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. There's an easy mistake here we can make in understanding who Paul is addressing. Just as elders in the previous section isn't indicative of an age group, younger here also isn't indicative of an age group. Peter clarifies this nicely when he writes, clothe yourselves, therefore, all of you. This is everyone, including the elders who he was just addressing. Peter's making the distinction here that he has shifted his focus from those who are in eldership to everyone. So being in a position of leadership does not take you out of the congregation. And as before, Peter gives us some points for consideration of what it means to be a tr- in true Christian community. I've got four. Be humble. Cast your anxieties on God. Be sober-minded and watchful. Be firm in your faith. When we look at humility, Peter stresses this not simply humbleness. This is not simply humbleness, but humility toward another person. And he contrasts humility with pride. 
which isn't too much of a surprise for us. And yet we do have a difficult time with it. One of the commentators I read this week said, grace and pride are eternal enemies. Pride demands that God bless me in light of what I think I deserve. Grace will only deal with me on the basis of God's love, not on the basis of anything in me. Charles Spurgeon, many of you know, it's a uh, role model of mine, if you were, said, if you are willing to be nothing, God will make something of you. The way to the top of the ladder is beginning at the lowest round. In fact, in the church of God, the way up is to go down. But he that is ambitious to be at the top will find himself before long at the bottom. The point Peter is stressing is that we cannot be half humble. And neither can we be half prideful. We are either humble or prideful. Not in general, but in our everyday interactions. We either approach things in humility or we approach it with pride. And we cannot approach situations and say, that was enough humility. Now it's my turn to get what I deserve. We do this in our relationships, our friendships, our marriages. I did this for you, so you should do this for me. It's only fair. Fairness is and will always be in conflict with consideration, being considerate. And to be clear, I'm not talking about justice, because that is an entirely different thing. I'm talking about fairness and what we expect from one another and what we expect we should get. If we are truly clothing ourselves in humility when we approach one another, it would be without an expectation of what the other could do for us, but solely with the expectation of discovering what the Lord has for us. Peter tells us is this second point, to cast our anxieties on God. Easier said than done, right? In a sense, yes, but not for the reason you may think. This verse isn't intended to be taken as saying, don't worry about anything, don't have anxiety. God will see you prosper. To be clear, it isn't saying that. Peter is telling us to not try and take control of things that God has promised he would take care of. How do we do this? I'm going to quote my favorite dude, Charles Spurgeon again. Prayer tells God what the care is and asks God to help. While faith believes that God can and will do it, prayer spreads the letter of trouble and grief before the Lord and opens ale its budget. And then faith cries, I believe that God cares and cares for me. I believe that he will bring me out of my distress and make it promote his own glory. One of the big problems we have, and this is a tangent and I apologize for it, but one of the big problems we have is we call it the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel. And many of you are no doubt familiar with this concept. Essentially, this false gospel that gets preached all over the country, all over the world, is the idea that God gives us assurance of divine physical health and prosperity through faith. What it preaches is that we have the right to the removal of sickness and poverty that we are assured health in this life and wealth in this life because of our faith. This, of course, is ludicrous. Some might even call it redonkulous. <laughs> in just this book of 1 Peter alone, Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. There is no shortage of struggle that we will encounter. We are guaranteed to face trials in this life. And there is not a single passage in this book 
that promises that we will have in this, that promises something else, that promises the ease that the prosperity of gospel brings us. I don't think anyone here prescribes to this gospel, at least knowingly. You see, I think many of us accidentally prescribe to this gospel. We think to ourselves, of course I will face trials and suffer some, of course. The Lord isn't going to make me a bajillionaire. Yeah, of course. But he will spare me from the trials that are too hard to deal with. He loves me, so of course he will spare me from things that are too difficult. And yet, obviously, I'm not going to be the next Jeff Bezos. I don't even want that much money, but God was good, so he will surely give me a house and that car I always wanted. And if I work, I work hard, so I deserve these things. Or for those of us who struggle financially, surely God has a plan to get me this financial success that I need. I've been so dedicated to his work and seeking him that he will give me these things. That's the prosperity gospel infiltrating the true gospel. A sense of deservedness or earnedness in Christianity that ignores the very idea that the greatest gift we've been given we didn't deserve. We couldn't earn. And yet all of a sudden, we would get all these things. The true gospel of Christ is that Jesus dies for us and we get salvation and we get to see and experience his glory by working to build his kingdom on earth. End of transaction. We are owed nothing. And yet we owe everything. We don't even deserve what we're getting. Yet by his grace and mercy, he has given it. We already have as a free gift, Jesus being tortured to death in our place on the cross. So that we could know God. And we would ask for more. Now, don't get me wrong. We get more. We get more from God because he loves us and because he is God and he is full of grace and mercy. We get so much more. But we do not get to decide what we get and we do not get to feel entitled to it. We'll revisit that in just a little bit. The third point, for the last couple of points Peter makes, be sober-minded and watchful. Be firm in our faith. The instruction, the last part of the instruction, in expectation for the believers in this congregation. Simply put, we must be clear in thought. And we must be watchful, focusing only on Christ rather than the things of the world. And two, we must be strong in our faith consistent in taking on Christ regardless of the circumstances and sufferings that we experience. To answer the question of why Peter brings this up or how we should do it, Peter detailed very clearly here. Uh, and yet, as we look at this passage, Peter is clear, but he's clear to his first century audience. And they know something that we don't. So when Peter brings up this idea of your adversary, the devil that prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. There's a couple of things we need to talk about. It is so important for us to understand that Satan is not omnipresent, and neither is he omniscient. He is not all-knowing, and he is not everywhere at once. 
He is not all places at all times, and he does not know all things. He is a finite being, limited in ability and power. He is not comparable to God. And he is not the antithesis of God. He is simply a being who wishes for us not to worship God. And the reason I say this is because I don't, we don't talk about Satan much. I've not really heard about him in my time here, or I've heard about him, I haven't talked about him in my time here. It's on me, not you, that I haven't said it. But I hear about him a lot in conversations. And I want to clarify that when we sin, or we stray from God, that's not the devil's work. It's our own work. It's my sin. I choose the world over God. I choose myself over God. Satan cannot compel me to do that. He cannot force me to do that. We cannot and should not place blame for our own pride, selfishness, and sinful on any being but ourselves. Jesus' death freed us from the bond of to sinfulness, and there is no being that exists who can override the saving grace of Jesus' death on the cross. Does Satan prowl? Does he tempt? Yes. Can I use that as an excuse? No, is what Peter is telling us. That we must be firm in our faith. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says that when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I'm not saying the devil isn't at work, but simply that we give him far more credit than he deserves. Because it's easier than owning our sin and repenting. I say all of this again to set the correct standard and expectation we should have of ourselves and how we interact with one another. And now we have an indication of the expectation we should have of those who lead and an expectation we should have of ourselves in Christian community. And what's left is the expectation we should have of the Lord. What is it that the Lord does on our behalf? Peter continues, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. These are the things that we should expect from God. Because he gives it freely. We will not receive them perfectly until we are with our Father in heaven. The restoration work of Christ in our lives has already begun. And it is ongoing. He is restoring us to himself that we would be and are in relationship with our Savior. A relationship that was severed by sin and God came to earth himself to restore it. The work that is completed in heaven is, has begun now. It began 2,000 years ago. But it's more than that. All four of these words are fascinating and to understand them, we need to look at them together. When I initially said that this, these four words, this should be our expectation of God, some of you may have thought, well, that's not much at all. That's just four things. I have far more expectations. I need the Lord much more than that. And I wouldn't blame you for that. And the Lord doesn't blame you for that either. Because when we dig into these words, we find out just how tremendous God's role is in our life. 
The word restore in the Greek translates literally to mean to put in order, to make perfect, and to confirm. The word confirm in the Greek means literally to strengthen or make strong. The word strengthen in the Greek means literally to fix firmly in place, to establish or support. The word establish in the Greek means literally to provide a base, to found or to lay a foundation. These words are incredibly similar in meaning and one flows into the next and that is intentional. The idea that Peter is conveying, having walked with Jesus Christ, is that Jesus will be our everything. From the beginning to the end, he is with us. From the foundation of our faith to the most obscure places in our heart, he is there. He will be our sustainer, our restorer, our confirmation, our strength, our foundation. He will be and is everything. And he is and will continue to be our savior. Only the Lord can do this. And so only he is worthy of praise, as Peter writes, to him be the dominion, which is it's another word for glory. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Peter has laid out these final... Uh, in the final verses of this letter, the hope that he found in Christ and the followers who have come to know Christ. Because of the suffering and the persecution of the early church, there was a great deal of discouragement. And Peter sets out to help the early Christians understand and adopt the correct expectation of hope for their leaders, for each other, and for God. And it's crucial for us who do not encounter anywhere near the same persecution that the early church has faced. As Trudy mentioned earlier, there are Christians in the world who face similar persecution, but it isn't us. But that makes it so urgent for us to implement these practices. that we would hold ourselves to the standard laid out in scripture, that we would look to our leaders to shepherd the flock, be overseers, serve willingly and eagerly to be an example, that as members of the Christian body, we would be humble, that we would cast our anxieties on God, not trying to take control, but be firm in our faith. And finally, that all of us would look to the Lord for what he has given us, himself. That though we do not deserve it, he died for us and continues to work on our behalf to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us as who he always intended us to be, his beloved children. It is only through that work of the Lord that we can hope to achieve these things that Peter has laid out for us. Without God, we are hopeless. But with God, we are victors. Let us live in that glory. And as Peter ends his letter, so too will I end this message. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for the work you did on the cross. Lord, we ask this morning that you would continue to refine us, Lord. Lord, to polish us, our spirits, that we would become reflections of you, Lord, that we would have the faith to stand in your place on this earth, Lord, until you return. That that would be the call in our hearts, Lord. That we would accept the call of every believer to be ministers of your gospel, bringing your love to your people. So, Lord, we ask that you work in us and through us. And we love you and praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand for our closing song.
You may have noticed this morning that throughout the message I used some strange vernacular at different points. And this is due to my challenge to our youth group to give me five silly words to use this morning in my message. And the condition was that I had to use them all without letting you know. These words were dude, extrapolate, broski, and redonkulous. Oh, I'm sorry, and basement. <laughs> and if you didn't notice them, then I did a very good job using them. And if you did notice, you did a good job listening. <laughs> as we go from here, let us remember that our call as Christians is to glorify God. When Peter wrote this letter, it was to a hurting people, a suffering people, people who needed support and hope. And when he began the content of this letter, he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not blessed are you, Christians. Not blessed are those who persevere. But blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And blessed is he, God, Father, and Son, Holy Spirit, who fills us with inexpressible joy. Go in peace to live out God's love. Amen. Thank you.